going to ask you to read one more thing together as a congregation, and that's the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. So if you'll take that out, and let's just read that together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, may I not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. Because it is in giving that we receive. It's pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I'm going to say something, rever well, it's pretty revolutionary, uh, and that's that Scripture is still being written. 1,200 years after Jesus of Nazareth, there was a man named Francis, and he lived in Assisi. And his father owned a business, and St. Francis had a personal experience with God and was born again and he started being concerned about the poor just like South Brown County is concerned about uh, the ministerial alliance is concerned about Christian families uh, who are being scattered throughout the Middle East and the world in Syria and so he cared about the poor and he took some of his father's merchandise and sold it and gave it to the poor. And his father was a businessman, and this did not go well with his father. <laughs> You're getting too religious, Francis. He disinherited Francis so that Francis would no longer have access to any of his products or any finances that he had as Francis's father. And Francis said, it was good that my father disinherited me because now I am free from the family wealth and I can totally serve God. So he began to rebuild abandoned churches around Assisi. And people who were hungry to follow God began to follow Francis. He got a band of 12 disciples. He was such, full of such peace that if he stood still outside, birds would come and land on him. It's, you'll see in some people's gardens pictures of St. Francis with birds on his shoulder or birds on his hands. Here's a little known fact about St. Francis. He traveled, he and some of his followers traveled to Egypt and tried to convert the Islamic Sultan to a faith in Christ. And although he didn't convert, he was really impressed with a dedicated, loving, self-sacrificing life of St. Francis and his followers. And when I was in Sarajevo, which is an Islamic nation, the capital of an Islamic nation, I was really surprised to learn that although they burned all the Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches down, when the Ottoman Turks took over 600 years ago, they let the Franciscans stay because the Franciscans were living out what we just read. They were living out the teachings of Jesus. Now, this is a little interesting twist. So I go to the, the ancient, ancient Franciscan church. There are a couple of other ones that are more modern. And there, in typical medieval fashion, is the hand of one of the, the saints, the preserved hand of one of the early Franciscan uh, pastors or priests in Sarajevo uh, as a holy relic. And I, went, I attended Mass in the only Christian church in Sarajevo, a Roman Catholic church. Matter of fact, I did that with my wife when we were there later on helping the people of, of that war-torn area. But I was surprised. I didn't realize the Franciscans were that powerful. 
And here's an interesting thing. An Islamic sultan wrote the first religious liberty legal document in the history of the world to allow the Franciscans to stay in that area and minister to people, even though they weren't Islamic. That's the first legal freedom of religion document ever made in the history of the world. So what I'm saying is that Francis, as a young man, said, I want to be like Jesus. And he became like Jesus. Roman Catholic scholars, but also Protestant scholars, Orthodox scholars, Orthodox Christian scholars, all agree one of the most Jesus of Nazareth-like persons in the history of Christianity was named Francis from Assisi. You and I are sitting here today because we've known some people that are like Jesus. The Franciscans were the Catholic order that established all the churches from Mexico clear up the coast of California, clear to the north of San Francisco. And I had the privilege as a young man of, of meeting Franciscan monks and going to the mass when it was still in Latin. And I was taught that Catholics weren't going to heaven because they weren't born again. And after I was taking Latin in high school, so I would go to the Latin mass and I would translate it into English in my, my head. And after going to that Latin mass in the Queen of the Missions, which is located in Santa Barbara, I realized they're followers of Jesus just like we are. They approach it a little bit different. They have a liturgy and their mass is a little more elaborate than our communion service. But I began to realize Catholics are followers of Jesus too. And it upset me quite a bit that I'd been told that they weren't born again when I'd heard the sermons several Sundays, you know. Now, I prefer being Christian church, disciples of Christ. I'm not trying to make you priests and nuns and monks today. But we have brothers and sisters who are, are Roman Catholic that are following Jesus just like we are. And this message which I'm sharing you today, it's going out to everyone who has a computer because John has, has put our messages now on christianpraises.org YouTube. And you can actually look this up on Google and, and hear this message again. So to our brothers and sisters of the Roman Catholic faith, we appreciate in Vatican II you calling us uh, brothers and sisters, and today in this message I'm calling you the same thing, because we are deeply beholden to Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi revitalized the church. The church had fallen on really hard times. About 1000 AD, the Vikings began to raid Europe, and they were terrible raids. And they were raiding monasteries and convents and churches and destroying villages. And at the same similar time, the Huns were coming down out of northern Russia and conquered all of Hungary. And so all these tremendous stressors from a military standpoint were coming down on the church from the north. And the church from the south was engaged in this 300 years of war, and Rome was in terrible shape spiritually too, and I won't even go into that, but Roman Catholic historians would agree with that too. And God sent a man named Francis from a town called Assisi. And he was more like Jesus than almost anybody in the history of Christianity. And he wrote this absolutely wonderful prayer, and I give this to all my patients and to all the people that I see are new Christians, and I encourage them to read it every single morning before they begin. And I'd encourage you to take this home 
And as part of your morning devotions, read this every single morning. Because everything mentioned in here is the deepest desire of your heart as a Christian. You know, we have all these other desires to have a good job, to have our children be raised uh, in a safe environment and have enough shelter and food. We have all these other desires, but the deepest, deepest, eternal desires of our hearts are mentioned here. And you can do all these things in your life. You can be every sentence, I can be every sentence in St. Francis' prayer. If every day, throughout every moment of every day, I made up my mind to follow Jesus. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. We all deeply desire peace. I can't watch very often what's going on in Syria today or in Libya or in North Africa. All the terrible things, the terrorist things being done, I need peace. And the only way you and I can ever experience peace is to become an instrument of peace ourselves. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. We all long for love. We all long for more than just human love. We long for that everlasting eternal love which only comes from God. Where there is injury, pardon. Have you ever been pardoned for something you did that's wrong just by another human being? It's absolutely liberating and wonderful. And when you and I pardon other people, we are set free from anger. Where there is doubt, faith. Every one of us has doubts from time to time. But if we lead other people to a faith in Jesus Christ, we automatically have more faith ourselves. You can't really understand St. Francis' prayer without giving it away, every one of these things that he talks about. Where there is despair, hope. Carl Menninger, who founded the Menninger Clinic, said the most important thing he could give his patients was hope. And as Carl Menninger, who suffered from depression, as Carl Menninger gave his patients hope, Carl himself got hope. And that's the way it works with us. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Who today does not want to have light and joy in their life? And they're very similar to each other, aren't they? Who today doesn't want to be consoled? So the secret is to console others. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, had just been murdered by Herod. And that's precisely when Jesus was mourning John's death. That's when he fed the 5,000. Jesus realized, and you know, here's something about Jesus. Jesus himself was consoled by consoling other people and feeding them at the 5,000, right after John's murder. To be understood as to understand, you know, as we understand other people and love them, we understand ourself. To be loved as to love, you know, sitting around waiting for people to love me is not a wise thing to do. The wise thing to do is just go out and love other people and love will come to you. And you'll learn to love yourself. As you love and forgive and console other people, you'll learn how to love yourself. Because it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. What I'm telling you is, you are receiving God's love when you give it to other people. You are pardoned when you're pardoning other people. And when you die to yourself, that's when you're born to eternal life. It's really hard to give tithes and offerings. 10% of my 
net income, I'm not talking gross income, 10% of my net income, are you kidding me? That's really a painful thing to do. And then other offerings besides the tithe? Oh, get real. I got to buy food for my family. I got car payments, house payments, gas, electricity. It's painful to die to ourselves. But you know something? When we give to God all these things, including money, but just not money, everything, and we give to other people, we're going to be overflowing. Overflowing. And you know, when we invest our time and energy in other people, and our time and energy and resources in God's work, our heart follows our time and energy. I don't know about you, but I want my heart to follow good things. And every one of these things mentioned here are wonderful things. And of course, every one of these things are what Jesus did. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And the secret of dying is to do what St. Francis did and to do what Jesus of Nazareth did, and that's die every single day to yourself. And so when some, somebody interrupts your schedule, that's not an interruption, that's an opportunity to help somebody else. It's a whole new way of looking at life. But when you die every day to yourself and your own desires, doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself, but when you, when you reach out to other people, God will always reach out to you. And besides, you won't need antidepressants when you do this kind of thing. You'll feel so good about yourself that your brain produces all the antidepressants you need. It's a wonderful win-win situation, how God has created the endorphins and all the beta uh, uptake, serotonin uptake in our brain. So this light continues today. It, it's continuing in your life. It's continuing in Christians around the world. This eternal life is here and now. We live in heaven when we do these things. And that's why St. Francis wrote this prayer. He wanted to stay in heaven, here on earth. You know, when your body dies, there's not that much of a transition. You continue living. And if you're living in heaven when your body dies, you're in good shape. And God wants us to be in really good shape, not only as we approach death, but throughout every single thing in our lives. This light continues. Jesus' light and life are continuing every single day. The church was incredibly renewed by Francis of Assisi. It took 800 years before a pope took Francis' name. But the present pope is named Francis, after Francis of Assisi. And if those are you familiar with Roman Catholic, that's a little strange because Pope Francis is Jesuit. <laughs> so for a Jesuit to take a Franciscan leader's name, Francis, means he really must have been like Jesus, if you understand the Jesuits. And so I, for our benediction today, later on after our hymn of invitation, and after our God be with you, I'm going to ask you to remind each other, this light continues. And it will really continue if you and I bring peace, love, pardon, faith, hope, light, joy, consolation, understanding, love, pardoning, and dying to ourselves. This light will really begin to blaze in your life. Let us turn to our hymn of invitation.